You're watching Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following. and by viewers like you. I'm Mark Golub, and if you're one of those who is actively concerned about the future and well-being of the State of Israel, You've probably been concerned over the past few weeks with a number of issues that have transpired, including the nature of the relationship between the State of Israel and the United States in general, and more specifically, the relationship between President Barack Obama and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Well, to address some of the issues that have been raised, I am very fortunate to be joined by a wonderful panel here on this roundtable. On my left, the syndicated columnist Micah Halpern, an expert in Middle East affairs and in Muslim fundamentalism, author of the best-selling book Thugs, and Micah also publishes a blog entitled The Micah Report. And across from Micah, I'm joined by Susie Rosenbluth, the highly regarded editor and publisher of The Jewish Voice and Opinion, one of the leading Anglo-Jewish newspapers in the greater New York metropolitan area. I'm also pleased to be joined again by Dr. Gilbert Kahn, professor of political science at Kane University and a major Jewish liberal voice in the Jewish world today. And a frequent contributor to Shalom TV discussion, Dr. Stephen Baim, director of the Contemporary Jewish Life Department of the American Jewish Committee and of its Koppelman Institute on American-Jewish Israeli Relations. I thank all four of you for joining me again. Thank you very, very much. Thank Good to be here. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Well, I want to begin in an obvious place to start. I want to know what you all think about the Obama Netanyahu flap. And of course, we saw speeches by President Obama both at the State Department and then at APAC, and then Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke at APAC, but then he gave this exhilarating speech at the um, joint session of Congress in Washington. Susie, I want to begin with you. What is your, you know, your response in general to this, uh, what we're told is tension between President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu? I think what happened from the reports is that there were a whole bunch of sucker punches that happened. Um, Bibi Netanyahu was prepared to come. He thought he knew what was going to be said at the president's speech. And of course, he got called a few hours in advance and told that it was being changed and it was going to include this issue about the 1967 borders. And um, he got very angry uh, from loads and loads of reports and people who were close to him. Does everybody basically agree that Netanyahu became angry prior to that speech or because of that speech? In diplomacy at this level, uh, personal opinions happen, and we have that happening. There are too many forces at play, and you check those feelings. And sometimes, indeed, you might be personally angry, but you don't express that anger. With all due respect and to both the reports and everything else, they check their anger. They, they might be angry. They might be agitated, but they have to control those things. And they might actually jab, and they might sometimes elbow but they are checking those emotions. Without question. Mm -hmm. And I think what happened was, I agree, I'm, I'm certainly not saying that Bibi came here and, and you know, in, in, in a peak of rage and, and did something that was not carefully thought out and carefully planned. However, I think Obama also got sucker punched. I don't think Obama was expecting there to be the kind of outrage that he heard. He was giving a long speech. This was a, maybe an afterthought, I don't think he was expecting the media to forget about virtually anything else he said and say, oh, wow, we're going back to 1967. So I think what happened was, I think the people coming from Israel felt that they were, I'll use the word, sucker punched, and they were going to respond to it not with 
a temper tantrum, but with a thought-out response, I agree with you. I don't think Obama was prepared for what the media that is usually so favorable to him, they, they may even have thought they were being favorable to him. I don't think they were expecting it to raise the kind of emotions and tensions and outrage that it did. The whole flap uh, uh, seemed to be around the president using the phrase 67 borders with land swaps. What's wrong with that? It, did it bother you at all that he said that? No, but it, it, it did not bother me. But I think the flap starts much earlier. I think the flap starts because when Speaker Boehner invited Netanyahu to come and address the joint session of Congress, mm -hmm. which is his prerogative and perfectly acceptable, there was a certain di concern within the White House when they found out about this because he, they knew he was coming for the APEC conference, they knew he was going to have an address, and they knew there was going to be, as there always is, a White House visit. So the question becomes, who is going to set the agenda? Who is going to determine the framework within all of this, within which all of this happens? And as the Palestinian and uh, uh, the Palestinian Authority and, and 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 Hamas began to make their moves just prior to the visit, it added another component that overlay the whole visit. Now, what upset everybody, I think, was that when the president shows a neutral audience to give his address on Thursday, the State, the Department. State Department, where there was not going to be a reaction, suddenly it became, I'm, he's not only going to talk about the Arab world, he's going to talk about the peace process because he knew he wasn't going to get applause or booze in the State Department. And he chose, and I think mixed apples and oranges and, and hmm. made, a, made a mistake at that point. But it was also a play to tell BB. And his mistake was? to mix the two at, at that point in such a dramatic manner that he ended up taking the Arab uh, uprising, the Arab Spring, off the table virtually in the eyes of the press. Okay, so it started out as a, as a speech about the Arab Spring of course. and ultimately ended up about well, the Israeli-Palestinian yeah, but, but there, conflict. But there's another Is thing. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, but there's another thing. You see, he also took the opportunity to tell Netanyahu, you're coming to America and I'm setting the framework of our mm -hmm. discussion. You think you're going to go to the Congress and set the framework, I'm setting that framework. And because he's, what he was, I think, saying was, if you come to Washington, you talk to the executive branch. Don't go over my head, because I can play that game, too. Okay. In your, your assessment is that the speech was a subtle message to Obama, I'm sorry, no, a Netanyahu. subtle message to Netanyahu, that in some way his agreeing to speak to the Congress offended the process from Obama's perspective? I think it did. Do you think so too? What was uh, particularly glaring in the speech was not the issue of the 67 lines. I think the phrase perhaps was a bit surprising and infelicitous, but uh, the real, there really were two other elements here. Number one is that uh, the president basically tried to um, align himself with his predecessors and saying, I didn't say anything new here. I just repeated what others have done. And his defense basically is that every American president since 1967 has opposed acquisition of territory by, di by dint of that war. However, um, there are two other major exceptions here. The 2004 Bush letter right. uh, basically said something much, 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 much more specific, explicitly excluded return to the 67 lines for reasons we can, we can talk about. Secondly, uh, excluded any kind of Palestinian right of return by saying the refugee problem must be solved within the state of Palestine. When the president set forth his prescriptions, he said we're deferring refugee issues to some future time. That is something that would upset an awful lot of people. There's a wall-to-wall -wall coalition in Israel from the far left to the far right that rejects the right of return. As for the issue of borders, Reality is, is that the, uh, the Clinton parameters, which were the most uh, liberal, if you will, in terms, of the, uh, uh, in terms of the peace negotiations, the Clinton parameters did allow for a limited number, I believe three Israeli facilities, military facilities, to remain on the West Bank for a negotiated period of time. Um, certainly, Prime Minister Rabin, who was always seen as the architect of the peace process, he called for Israeli troops in the Jordan Valley. So that by using this, what I call this infelicitous phrase of return to the 67 borders, I think what the president meant by it, and certainly what he, tried, what he clarified a lot better in, uh, uh, on Sunday, was that um, 
the borders will be negotiated and there will be land swaps in order to absorb Israeli Jewish settlements on the West Bank and at least large numbers of the, the settlement blocks. He was also saying that uh, there will be a state of Palestine that will take up a large percentage of the West Bank, and he wanted that point made clear. But uh, the, the Prime Minister of Israel, I think, was fully within his rights in saying that um, I believe the Jordan Valley issue is something to be negotiated. I believe Israeli security is something I've got to defend and look out for. And uh, it's wrong to say that every president has articulated what President Obama said. Uh, other presidents have offered somewhat different prescriptions that were far more reassuring uh, to Israeli leadership. Two quick questions. <clears throat> when you heard him say 67 borders with land swaps, was there any question in your mind what he meant? I thought what he meant was the settlement blocks. But I also knew very well that uh, <laughs> Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu's agenda is very much the Jordan Valley. And I was immediately reminded, reminded of the fact, and as I said to my wife and my colleagues, I said, Rabin, who was the great icon of the peace process, uh, also said, I will never withdraw from the Jordan Valley. Um, what that meant, obviously, is something to be negotiated. But you're talking about a military withdrawal. Right. You're not talking about a border. I mean, what Netanyahu has said, and what many prime ministers have said, is that there will always be a military presence, or for a long time, a military presence. And Obama said the same thing in his speech. There will be, it will take a long time. There will be a phased withdrawal over a long period of time before Israeli troops will be removed from the West Bank. But I don't understand when you say to me, I heard bo 67 borders with land swaps, what you imagined he was saying that was any different than has ever been said. What was new there? I want to hear what Steve says. What was new to you when you heard that? No, my, my initial reaction was quite as you say, Mark, namely that uh, he, was, he was calling for a, a ret return of 90, 95% of the West Bank with land swaps regarding the major settlement blocks. Isn't However, that, Isn't that, by the way, what the Jewish community has assumed would happen? Yes, except that um, I think since, since the prime minister you know, took office in place of Olmert, his main changes or his main agenda really have been two things. Number one, uh, Jerusalem should remain united and divisible. And number two, that uh, on the Jordan Valley, that is the exact borders, if you will, is something to be negotiated. Now, you're qualifying by saying that only means a military presence. It doesn't mean exact borders. You think I'm wrong? Well, I think that's exactly the sort of issue that needs to be uh, ironed out in negotiations. And the reaction against the president was uh, this perception, at least, that he's putting the end game before the starting point. And just so our audience understands, can you explain to me how Israel could change the border along in, in the Jordan Valley in a way that's contiguous with the border of Israel in, towards Jerusalem? Are you suggesting there's going to be a border adjustment in the Jordan Valley? I am very skeptical about uh, you know, about the future course of negotiations under any circumstances. But do you think that's what Prime Minister Netanyahu means? There should be a border adjustment along the Jordan Valley. Look, I think there's a world of difference between uh, where, uh, you, know, his, um, you know, his plan right now is let the, let, let's not begin with the, bo with the border lines of 67 as a starting point of negotiation. That's what we should perhaps get to, if you will, down the road. But let's not put that out as a, as a starting point. Uh, perhaps instead of 90%, it might be 80% or 75%. Who knows? Those are all things that have to be uh, uh, worked out. And he's saying, don't disregard Israeli security. And now, was Israeli he be, security has he be, to do with Was the, he being disingenuous when he said, There's n I said nothing new here? Was President about Obama's this, being disingenuous? About the 67 borders with land swaps. Disingenuous is a very harsh word because it assumes a kind of desire to mislead people. Um, I think the statement that there's nothing new here is not an accurate statement for the two reasons I mentioned. This issue about Palestinian right of return. No, that's that not involved in the 67 borders. Stay on focus here. Like he I'm asking it. you whether the 67 borders with land swaps was new. It wasn't new to you. It um, who was it, it was new, new to? Yeah. Who was it, it wasn't new to? From the presidential point of view, it was new. It was a paradigm shift. And it's important to see that paradigm Explain shift. Explain it to me. Well, what happens is, president, this was a policy speech. It was not a presentation to a biased organization. It was billed as a policy speech, and we were getting emails for weeks that something new was going to be happening here. And it's important to recognize it from their point of view also. It is the first time a president stood up and said this, regardless of whether or not the State Department said it or the Secretary of State said it. This is a very new phenomenon. But the thing which ultimately changed the paradigm is that the model shifts because the 
ideal goal of the Palestinians is to work to the 67 borders. So what the president stood up and did exactly. is he gave the entire negotiation out. We're starting now with the end game as opposed to the negotiation process. And that's where the shift of the model takes place. That's deeply problematic. Why? Because across the board, from the time this president stepped into office and since Netanyahu stepped into office, there have not been negotiations. Why? Because the president said there's not going to be negotiations if there's settlement. After settlement stops, negotiations start. And as a result, the Palestinians said we have a hero in the White House. Right. And they stopped all negotiations. Now, the president bit off way too much. Why? Because of a conceptual understanding. Settlement to the Israelis is not the same as settlement to the Palestinians. So putting on a porch in your Jerusalem house is called settlement to the Palestinians, whereas it's called putting on a porch on your Jerusalem house <laughs> to a Jerusalem. It's on the, on the side of the green line. Where, 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 yes, and, but, uh, and it's an important distinction. So these definitions have never been made. As a result, the president then runs to the end. The Palestinians have refused to negotiate. If you're not going to negotiate, how do you get to these things? So articulating the final stage first is a big problem. And that means not only do they have to sit down and negotiate, they have to give something other than the promise. Smart. And that's what's missing. Do you see it the same way? Yeah, but to some extent, I, I do. But, but there's, there are two little things that are not inconsequential. One is that the president spoke in public what had previously been understood in negotiations. And I think that's the distinction between previous administrations. He said words in a public setting articulating policy, policy. that exactly. was understood exactly. by others and but understood by the Israelis for many, many governments, but he said it in a public forum. And, and, and that's and significant. In what way? It's significant, it, certainly as the Israelis interpreted it. That's why he can say, and I think he's correct, I, I, I guess I somewhat disagree, he can say, I didn't say anything new, <laughs> and they can say, but you did because you took it out of the executive office and you put it up front, out front, and that's In important. a televised speech. Yeah, but now, one more question. Was Camp David executive? No. Was I the Camp know. David process of 2000 when Clinton, Arafat, and Barack meet to try to figure out a peace solution, is that executive? Totally private. Is it executive? It's executive, but it was private. Uh, In other words, yeah, I mean, how, it was a private meeting. Okay, but, but uh, uh, everybody understood what was being offered by Barack, where the starting point was, what land he was offering, and we laud that offer by Barack, and we vilify Arafat for not accepting it. It's the same offer that was made by Ehud Olmert. So to say to me this has been what? Nobody knows what the offer is, and the fact that all he did, all, Bar all Obama did was articulate what Levi Eshkol said, what Ehud Barak said, and what Ehud Olmert said, and what every Jew I ever hear talk about a two-state solution says. If, we talk, if you talk to a Jew who's, who believes in a two-state solution, it's always with this notion. What about we start with the 67 borders, and then we will, trade par we will trade land, we will keep all the land around the settlements of Jerusalem, and we'll deal with, Jer with Jerusalem itself as an issue that has to be dealt with, which is what Obama said. And four or five years ago, we began throwing in the notion, and Israel will give up some of the land inside the Green Line in return for the land we take from the West Bank. I, I'll say it again. I just don't understand. I knew exactly what he meant when I heard the State Department speech. There were other parts of the speech that bothered me, but not that part. But it was all in context. I think what we've heard all along is that the Palestinians have expected, and I think they've gotten that from nuances and from things that have actually been said, that they were waiting for the president to deliver Israel to them. They were waiting for, I think even, I think at one point even Hillary Clinton said that the idea of returning to the 1967 borders with some swaps was the Palestinian goal. He articulated what Hillary Clinton is had Is it the Jewish goal? The Jewish goal is peace. The Jewish goal, the Jewish I, I, goal. I may be the only one who, at this table, and if I am, I understand it. I believe that's the Jewish goal. The Jewish goal no, is to start no, with the 67 no, borders, make adjustments no. that protect Israeli security. The Jewish security. goal, as Bibi said so well,
is for the Palestinians to say, we are willing to live I alongside, no, that, no, 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 a fair. Jewish state, that Palestine fair. will be the end of the conflict, and that fair. Palestine will not be used to continue the conflict. That's not fair. I think it's exactly you, fair. Are, I'm talking about where does the Jew believe the ultimate resolution of this will be? And I believe the Jew who's in favor of the two-state solution believes it will start with the 67 borders and there will be some territorial I disagree adjustments. with you. Okay. Now, there's Tell me, you disagree with me also? Uh, there's a process question. And the process is, is it the role of the Prime, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel or the role of the President of the United States to handle this? It's the Prime Minister of Israel with the leader of the Palestinian Authority. And so what we have instead here is a superimposition from a different world. That is, the President of the United States came in and actually articulated not just the goal, which you're adequately presenting, and I accept that, but not only that, given the end game. And that was deeply problematic because there's a whole process called negotiations, which have been put off. You can't come to resolution without negotiations. And now those negotiations include, by the way, the ending of an entire hatred which exists. Exactly. So they have to stop teaching hatred. See, look, they didn't choose the term Nakba out of uh, the <laughs> air. They chose the word catastrophe, which is interesting. Catastrophe is what the Holocaust used to be called before we came up with the name Shoah. Right. That's what we translated in the Chorban and the Ason. It's a very important notion. They're paralleling the notion of Holocaust with the notion of the creation of the state. But how did the Jews come out of the Holocaust? Their emphasis was not as much as we're directed towards the past, we're ultimately directed towards the future. We are building a state of Israel with all kinds of great creativity. We're not teaching hatred of the Nazis. We don't do that. We don't teach hatred of the Poles. We don't do that. The schools you are filled. You can teach filled. hatred of the Nazis, not of the Germans. No, 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 no. We even, and you, the Bauer's spectacular essay about demystification of the Holocaust is hugely important. We teach about the reality. They are teaching hatred, and until that stops, we're not going to be able to sit down and have negotiations to reach the end that you're articulating, which I think is an important end. I'm talking about process now, and the President of the United States stepped out of the process. And when he did this, he superimposed with his power and the bully pulpit, without a doubt. And that's why Israelis were offended, people in favor of the two-state solution. America was offended, and that's why Congress was upset. Right. Congress was upset. Who are you to dictate these terms? That's to an ally. I, I think we should talk about Congress independently, but I want to okay. just clarify one thing. Mm -hmm. See, if I hear the words, 1967 borders, with swap, with land swaps. The question is, am I hearing that as I believe in the 67 borders with land swaps as the place where the discussion begins? Or am I hearing those words as the place where it ends? And that, I think, at the end of the day, is really what, what the discussion was. And there was an interpretation that the president said, this is where it ends. Mm -hmm. And Look, in fairness to the president, by the way, on Sunday, you know, three days later, he was quite unequivocal Correct. Uh, in saying that the border to be negotiated will not be the June 4th, 67 border. He said that it, on a biased group, the a biased group, again, not a policy clear and unequivocal. Only for somebody who didn't understand what he Co meant. No. That's correct. But Steve is correct. I think that he said it. And he didn't, but wait, and I'm at APEC. Nobody who was upset with him on Thursday walked out happy on Sunday. <laughs> he That's didn't correct. convince That's anybody correct. that correct. he meant something different. That's correct. It was silly. I knew what he meant on Thursday. I knew what he meant on Sunday. There are things that bother me about his speech, and I thought his speech in Cairo was horrendous. But I'm saying to myself, I don't understand, even as you talk about process, even as you talk about the end game, the beginning game, I'm thinking to myself, I just can't understand when you say to somebody, I want to negotiate with you. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that what we're saying is we want Israel and the Palestinians to sit down, number one, number one, before anything. Both sides have to say the other side has a right to exist. Th can I stop you okay. for a minute, it was Mark? damage control on Mark. Sunday, and the fact he didn't was do he, 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 didn't, didn't, he didn't achieve do much. it. Right. No, okay. I, but but I just, Mark, correct. Mark, okay. Mark, but Mark. The first, the first, issue, thing, the issue the first is, thing is to say each side recognizes the other's right to exist. As what? And you have, because this has and been a... And by the way, as a Jewish state... The homeland of the Jewish and people. isn't it interesting? He's, I'm sitting here, and you may have been on, on the panel, when... Bibi Netanyahu uses the phrase a Jewish state in his Bar Ilan speech. Uh, Bar Ilan? Yeah. 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 Yep. There were American Jews who were upset that he added the word Jewish. Why did he have to say a Jewish mm -hmm. state? Why couldn't it simply be two states? We have our state, they have their state. 
And all of a sudden, the President of the United Correct. States, Barack Obama, goes out of his way to make For a point. America, excuse me, to America the, to recognize excuse it, me, not the Palestinians. On Thursday, his point was mm -hmm. Israel is a Jewish state. He and was a speaking, Jewish homeland. He, and a Jewish homeland. Yeah. No president has been so clear. Absolutely. And he's speaking to Europe, which is who he's about to get on a plane and go to Europe. He tells, he says in unequivocal terms, that I'm thrilled yes. that, that, that a president a says oh, let me a Jewish state. Here. He also problems. said, he says to the Palestinians, no, don't go to the United says. Nations. Yes. You know he says, says to the Palestinians, you've got to stop this Hamas Fatah agreement. He says to the Philippines. Yes, he did. No, he, he said, didn't. He said, if you want no, negotiations, yes, you've got to stop it. APAC, no, he I'll, said it on no, Thursday. On Thursday, Thursday, he said it was Thir problematic. Let me, let me I'll, 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 you can't expect Israel to negotiate with somebody who wants your destruction. This he said great, that on Thursday. I'm almost right. done. He <laughs> also, he also <laughs> recognizes in a way that no, I've heard no member of State Department, not Hillary, not yes. Barack Obama, say the reference, the attempt to delegitimize Israel. And that it will not, it will fail. He says it will fail. Excellent. Okay. And he says the Palestinians must recognize the state of Israel's right to exist. Mark. I have heard no president At, in any America. speech do as much to he articulate. Did he say exist as a Jewish state? Yes, that he, is, did. No, he did. He, yes, he, he did. said the Americans okay. recognize. No, no. It. You find I will be happy to fight it for you. I will fight. I will recognize Israel as what a Jewish What America state. and the international community. I. You know, it's interesting how you heard it. <laughs> what America and the international community can do is state, frankly, what everyone knows. A lasting peace will involve two states for two people. Israel as a Jewish state and the homeland for the Jewish people. Yeah, I and the state of Palestine is a homeland. And I'm saying, no, I want to make this point. I want to make this point. Because and this has this nothing here. Nothing here. Nothing here is personal. But I want you to understand that you are you have expressed something that I've heard everywhere I go. I'm sitting at APEC and people swear to me. He didn't use the phrase with lamb swaps in his Thursday speech. <laughs> well, that's, you that's, sit, that's, you yeah. sit here today and tell me he only said America, no. and you forgot the, the international phrase community international community. And the Palestinians said that the international community can do it. We don't have to recognize, we recognize Understood. Israel, not as a Jewish state. Mark, I think you're missing the point of everything you, you've just said, and that is that the real significance of these entire few days is that there is far more convergence between America and Israel, then there is yes, divergence. Correct. Yes. And the Jewish community, at times in its hysteria, yes. you know, refuses to accept the good news. That the is good, correct. The good news is that America and Israel are closely aligned, closely aligned on security matters, on military matters, and frankly, on these value-oriented matters of what do we share in common. What was disturbing about the speech, and I, I grant you fully, too many people did not hear the term land swaps or mis didn't want to hear it, or misheard what they heard. <laughs> what was really disturbing about the speech, I think, are some of the things, though, that have been said, about, that have been said around this table. Number one, raising this issue about uh, our refusal to repudiate the right of return, Correct. which, again, is a major, a major item. And we can't, a right of return means two Palestinian states. You know, it means a Palestine state of Palestine and a Palestine state of Israel. Correct. Which they can agree uh, that, by the way, democratically is his, is his to, uh, to genius decide they should in join. asking for a Jewish state. Asking for, that's, Absolutely. That's Bibi's genius, which no other prime minister identified. It was only a year ago that's where correct. he correct. said the Palestinians have to recognize a Jewish yes. state. Why yes. is it genius? Because of exactly the point that Stephen's making right now. It would become two Palestinian states after the right of return and or in a certain amount of time because they believe in the, in the power of the womb in the weapon of the womb, which, by the way, is a misnomer in the first place. But that's, uh, we can get into that another time. And as a result, he needs to have articulated this notion. And the, the White House said that's a no-brainer. Obviously, everyone knows that Israel is a Jewish state. But when he articulated this, he said, just wait. This was a year ago in the White House. Just wait. Ask them to do it. That's right. And they said sorry, it's a no- as, uh, the, To recognize uh, Israel as a Jewish the, state. Uh, Netanyahu asked the administration in Washington to send out feelers to the Palestinian leadership to recognize Israel as the Jewish state and the Jewish homeland, just like he had just previously recognized the Palestinian state as a Palestinian homeland, just uh, to have reciprocity on that level. And the White House said it's a no-brainer. Obviously, it's the Jewish state. Said, we need those words. Just see if it can happen. See, because nuance in Arabic is huge, as it is, by the way, in Hebrew. But we've lost it in English. This is a point which will be very difficult for them to swallow 
in the Islamic world and in the uh, Palestinian world. And, he asked, and so their answer was very shrewd. The answer of the Palestinians was they can define, Israel can define themselves as they wish. It's not for us. That, they recognize Israel as Israel, but they're not going to recognize it as a Jewish state. And that's a big difference. And this, by the way, is part of the genius in this, in this principle. It's a defensive mechanism, maybe. Maybe the push-off negotiations. I don't know what the opposite objective is. But I can say that it certainly identified a major major principle, which is very sensitive to the Jewish okay. people, and by the way, to Congress, which yeah. I'm coming back I, to. I'd also like to, say a word, <laughs> I'd like to say a word about the Prime Minister, if I, if I may. What he has done specifically is he has altered the language of discussion yes. about the future of there the West we Bank. It is not about history. It's not about religion. In that sense, he's repudiated both the Gush Emunim, as well as the West Settlers Movement, as well as portions of his own party. Right. What he has said is that the discussion has to take place on grounds of preserving Israeli security. Now, the fact that the president on Sunday came back to that and reaffirmed it, that was reassuring. I'm not sure people heard it, or was that clear, or clear and explicit in the Thursday address. But I'm, I think there's absolutely agreement among all five of us on the point that the real issue is not the 67 borders, I don't think. It is on the fate of the refugees. I want to read that to you in one moment and then have you comment. I also assume all of you were as thrilled as I was when Netanyahu framed the question for the world in a way that is, on the one hand, obvious, but on the other hand, I've never heard a prime minister state it this way. Our conflict has never been about the establishment of a Palestinian state. It's always been about the existence of the Jewish state. Brilliant. This is what the conflict is about. And I said to myself, exactly. And if the world understood that, we would be much further down the road. And Hamas does not understand it. Not, they only, understand. not only don't they understand it, they reject it unequivocally. They understand it. They reject it. They reject it unequivocally. And the, and the president, again, was forthcoming in saying this hamas Fatah agreement is a major setback. Absolutely. But nonetheless, he was pushing Israel to sit down, That's recognizing, right. and that was, part of the, that was part of the mistake in the logic, uh, also part of the offense that Israelis took to it, less so than the United States, yeah. that the, it's one thing to push Israel to sit, but you can't push them to sit if, there's no, if you don't have an answer to the problem with the Palestinians and uh, authority and Hamas together. Yeah. So you, you've created a situation where I'm pushing you forward, but I know you can't go forward because he there's an untenable now. situation. You know, you know what was interesting to me, Mika, was that, that I heard that too, and I, I, I agree. But what it kept ringing in the back of my mind was Madrid, pre-Madrid, and the whole relationship with the PLO. In what sense? In the sense that, you know, we went through an enormous period of time in which the U.S. and the Israelis said, we're not talking to them at all. They're not even up for discussion. There's nothing. We, we won't even sit with them. And, you know... Things evolved through a lot of uh, history. No, but they changed they got the charter. They, they changed the charter. No, no, I was in Gaza when no, they changed the Mika, charter. I was there with Clinton. Absolutely correct. Yeah. So what happens is, this is where we are now. Now he did not push and he sort of rejected Hamas. But the fact is that you know this is sort of a by stating the lines like that from the U.S. perspective, he's also telling the the, the Palestinians and Hamas. We're standing with them on this. You guys have to figure out some modality to bring yourselves into a position. Gil, that was the problem. What he said was, was he was he was addressing the issue of the um, of, of Fatah and Hamas, the reconciliation, as a problem, a philosophical exercise, if you will, something they had to work out. Israel, however, is going to accept the 1967 borders with some swaps. And there was not a word there when he, he did say the international community. It has to be much more direct. The Palestinians must accept Israel as a Jewish state and that the issue of the refugees will not be solved within Israel's borders. He did not say that. He didn't? No, he did not. Bibi let said me see it. Bibi said let, it. Let me see if he did say that. On Thursday, on Thursday, he certainly he did. did not say that. I mean, that was the problem it. with Thursday's speech. On Sunday, he, he incorporated these things. He, you don't think he said it, huh? I know he Actually, there was, the, the okay. speech was an eight-page speech. Explain, only, explain only to me what 700 this means. 700 words. Okay. For the Palestinians, efforts to delegitimize Israel will end in failure. Symbolic actions to isolate Israel in the United Nations in September won't create an independent state. Palestinian leaders will not achieve peace or prosperity if Hamas insists on a path of terror and rejection. And Palestinians will never realize their independence by denying the right of Israel to exist. 
Israel to exist. They say we don't reject the right of Israel to exist. Palestinians will never. They Israel don't president. reject the right of Israel to exist. They yes, resent, they do. They reject yes, they the do. right of Israel to exist as the Jewish state. I'm sorry, but wait. For a president to say Palestinians yes. will never realize mm -hmm. their independence, and if I'm a Palestinian, I don't like that sentence at all. They didn't. If I'm a Palestinian, like I don't like that. anything about his speech. Okay, I want to go to the, the but issue. But they still they, felt that they were pushing they them did to not the end. Enjoy, they they, they, they hated this speech. It was a very anti-Palestinian speech. Was it was not an anti-Israel speech. What was interesting, though, is that um, Abdullah of Jordan and Abbas met afterwards. And Abdullah uh, th uh, said to Abbas that, uh, and this is from Abbas's people, not from Abdullah's people, said, uh, the speech, the, that last page, which is the 700 words dedicated to this question right. of a whole eight-page speech, that's because of me. I pushed the president on the 67 border lines. Really? So that's what he took credit for, which is very, very interesting. So it goes again, suffice in the face of the Washington Post uh, piece about jabbing. He says he took credit for pushing, uh, pushing uh, the question mm -hmm. of 67 borders. I want to there read, is also I want to a read difference between, between them saying that they will not succeed. It doesn't say the United States will stand against them. It's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a nuance to it that doesn't equate the two. That uh, Israel is being asked to accept the 1967 borders with the swaps, whereas the rest of it, these are, these well, are philosophical uh, problems that the Palestinians have to No, I, I think the, the president went on record, and this is something we should cherish, is yes. that the... Uh, the attempt to solve this problem through unilateral declaration of independence Correct. is something that we are uh, we are opposed right. to. And the fact that he went on record here is of enormous consequence. Well, there's also there's a movement now against it because of this unity between Hamas and, yes. and the Palestinian Authority, sure. which would not have happened, actually. And that's Abba Ibn's great quote, the Palestinians never missed an opportunity mm -hmm. to miss an opportunity. 18 months before elections And in so America. here they were literally moving. The momentum was moving where Europe was in favor of it. The people that the United States blocks or the Western bloc was in favor of this uh, September vote. And now the, uh, regardless of what we think around this table, the Europeans have a major stay, uh, uh, way of speaking in the international community, and they are against Hamas. This is the paragraph on Fatah and Hamas agreement, then you comment for me. When was this? This was on Thursday at the Thursday. State Department. In particular, the recent announcement of an agreement between Fatah and Hamas raises profound and legitimate questions, questions. for Israel. How can one negotiate with a party that has shown itself unwilling to recognize your right to exist. Philosophical discussion. No, I think it was a very important statement. That's the sort of thing I applauded unequivocally. Absolutely. And that's why I say there's much more convergence between America and Israel than the media would have us believe at this stronger. point. It could have been stronger and it should uh, it's, have been stronger. It's, it's adequate for our purposes. It's adequate for the purposes of uh, American-Israeli relations. It's okay. a clear oh, statement. Oh, Only when it stands independent. The other problem, though, was the pushing towards the 67. The, sit and negotiate. You see, the point is the, the pushing to negotiations with the recognition that there's a problem with Hamas. You see, there's a legal question that we've, already, we've discussed at other times. The United States cannot give money to Hamas. Correct. It's a legal issue. Congress will not accept it. Okay, and it's a critical component. The Palestinian Authority is together linked with Hamas. In the past, when they linked before, just after their previous election, 2006, they linked and Congress stopped that money. Now, the president has the possibility of a waiver. He can give money despite Congress's uh, desire. But Congress can clamp down them and, actually not just that, they can challenge them in the Supreme Court also, which is an important question. By the way, you know what's, <laughs> what strike keeps striking me about this whole you know, uh, a, a alliance now that's developing. He said, I'd like to see where they are in October. <laughs> in other words, how, ex how much of this entire <laughs> negotiation has been a matter of expediency mm -hmm. in order to present a face before the UN that, of, of, that, unity, of unity. Now, I'm not saying it's going to break apart, but it, for, it doesn't surprise me at all if it were to ha happen, they go, they'll go forward. So that from the perspective of the U.S. and from yeah. the Congress, you know, there are ways to play with the money that's in the pipeline. You could say we're suspending, we don't know, we're reconsidering. We, the, the White House could say we're going to go ahead with humanitarian stuff. I mean, there are ways to play with some of this if, in fact, they are going to try to... I think, we, need, I think we should recall something else, though, Gil, and that is that, uh, you know, the quartet has imposed three major conditions for Hamas to accept before they can be party to negotiations. Right. That's renounce, renunciation of violence, acceptance of Israel's right to exist, 
an agreement to abide by previous agreements. Right. Right. Now, Hamas goes nowhere near there. And they said I, they won't. I prefer if they added on a fourth one, actually, and that is the Hamas charter must be uh, significantly amended to drop its anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. We add is, to that, actually, that they should take steps, not just denounce, but they should take mm -hmm. steps against terror, not just denounce Correct. terror. Can I ask you we a question? Add that, but, um, you sure can. Do you think there is a real partner for peace now with Israel? No. I think that they can prove themselves to be a partner. They have not proven to be a partner. People move in directions. Right now, they've moved away. Just like, by the way, Turkey has moved away from the Western Bloc. The Palestinians have moved away. And they have an agenda, by the way. This is not uh, a, uh, a decision to join with Hamas. It was not a simple decision made at the drop of a hat. It was an agenda. And part of that agenda was to distance themselves in a certain way from the United States and receive the the uh, tongue lashing that they were going to get, but to move ahead and try to unite other parts of the Muslim world, which I think is very, very important for us to see. So I think there is a possibility for a partnership, but they are moving away from that partnership right now with, uh, with Israel. The Prime Minister gave them actually a good number of things to chew on, including, mm -hmm. for the record, dismantling of some settlements, settlements, which is, again, a new statement in and of itself. He's opened the door. Uh, I wish that uh, the other side would take him at his word and say we have a stronger opportunity to create a Palestinian state today than at any moment in history, and uh, uh, come, come to the peace table on that basis. I don't, um, I don't see that happening right now. I'm very skeptical. And the, uh, both the hamas Fatah agreement is one major statement that we will never accept a Jewish state. The other, frankly, though, is uh, Abbas's op-ed piece uh, in the New York right. Times, which, uh, <laughs> which basically, aside from its distortions of history, was also a sort of a statement that uh, our next strategy is to defeat Israel's legality. Well, you can't make peace with someone that you are trying to undermine their legality at the same time. So is your answer at the moment no? Uh, I wish it were otherwise. I think the door is open. And I'm, I, I'd say just as uh, changes are possible, we, should, we as Jews should keep open, an open mind about the possibility of change. But right now, I just don't see it. I, I, agree, with, I agree with Steve, with, with, and, and I don't see at the moment that there is somebody specifically ready to sit down in a serious way to accept the terms. But there's another piece on this, and that is that Abbas probably is on the way out, and Fayyad had a heart attack. And to some extent, even though in many people's minds in, in, the, in, the, in the Palestinian territory, he's not an acceptable leader in many eyes in the West, and, mm -hmm. and certainly in, after the economic development that he's been successful with, he could present a kind of figure who's sufficiently sophisticated and understands how that might be done. I don't know that he's even acceptable, but if, if in fact he's not going to be well, that eliminates two people who in fact conceivably would be able to move ahead. And I don't see who else there is. I don't think they're able to be moved to, uh, move ahead. They are in a model, in the previous model. And Fayyad is a, a brilliant thinker and helpful here, but he could not be acceptable within a certain element. But the reality is they are part of the past. The only way to move ahead here is new blood, and new blood has not been permitted into the leadership positions. Not only that, they're not having elections. Well, Bart and Gorky, for, for example, would like to get in. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. you mean out of prison? No. Well, yeah, but you know, the, there are discussions about how you do that. And He's only murdered like, how many Israelis? Uh, look, the Arafat had blood on his hands. That we we understand that we we recognize that. But, you know, the I spoke with Barghouti once about the sixty-seven borders, and he said to me in response, he said, "You're questioning whether or not parts of Jerusalem should be a part of sixty-seven borders." I asked the question about land swaps and everything else, and he said, "You should be lucky. I'm conceiving. I'm conceding mm -hmm. the question of the pre-sixty-seven borders that that you're in. I want every single exactly. piece." of post-67. That's why I said, when we talk 67 borders, it's, it means two different things to, to the groups here. And it's important for you to see. And he's, he said very seriously, I'm conceding that you exist on the other side of the border here. But I want everything. Not as a Jewish state. Well, no, no, that you exist. He didn't say that. That's uh, right. That you exist on the other side of the border here. Which I and consider then, to be a big concession on my but part. It was a huge right, concession. Right, right. Now, no, I was, I'm not saying this tongue-in-cheek. Right, right. I'm reporting exactly yeah. our dialogue. And he said, and with tremendous respect, by the way, and it's, it's a very, he's an anti-intellectual intellectual. He's an enormously great leader, this character Barghouti. It's a good thing he's in prison, because before that, he probably would have been toppled by internal forces within the Palestinian Authority. I want to ask you another question. Many people email, uh, all of us get emails all the time. I'm getting emails that tell me that there are people who believe Barack Obama is the most anti-Semitic 
president, the most anti-Israel president they've ever seen. Is Barack Obama anti-Israel? Absolutely not, but I'll tell you something how bad it is. At the APEC conference, people came to me and said to me, he's a Amalek. People came to me and said after, this is Chamberlain all over again. The extent to which, first of all, as you said correctly earlier, they didn't hear the second speech. And the, or the first they, speech, yeah. They heard it, they didn't listen. And how whatever they felt before last Thursday's speech, they were well, affected. I think there is a very real feeling uh, of certainly of dislike and, and disrespect uh, and uh, why la they, lack, lack of, why lack of they commitment. Wrong? Fear. Well, what? Why are they wrong? The people who call Obama a Malik and he's anti-Israel, why are they wrong? How do you know they're wrong? The record of the administration doesn't suggest to me, at least, that, uh, that he's done anything really that could be interpreted to, to be anti-Israel. Now, you could argue with the Cairo speech and certain things that were left out and certain statements that he made. You can say that he hasn't been as careful about certain kinds of language that he's used in some situations, or that the administration may have made some mistakes en route, but that's not evidence of being anti-Israel. I know what it is. First of all, is Obama anti-Israel? I have no idea. Oh, really? I have absolutely no. I don't know what's in his heart of hearts. I don't know what he thinks. Has his administration does done anything and, and made a move that we would say, oh, my gosh, that's anti-Israel? No. Do I know how he feels and what he might do in, an, in a second term? I have no idea. What I do know, what I do know is this. Um, when Bill Clinton was president, I think the Clintons took a certain amount of pride, and a lot of people said that uh, he was our first black president. Now, they didn't mean that he was an African-American. Nobody thought he was an African-American. They meant that there were certain sensitivities and sensibilities with, with which the African-American community could identify. Um, I remember when Rudy Giuliani was running, there were people who said, Rudy's going to be our first Jewish president. Now, no one thought Giuliani was Jewish. What they meant was that he had certain sensitivities and sensibilities with which the Jewish community could identify. I think in that same way, people say, and exactly that same way, when they say that Obama is our first Muslim president. I have no idea. I know people say he's a Muslim. I have no idea what he is. I don't know what he is. I don't know. I, I don't know what his, what his faith is. What I do know is that there is a feeling that his sensitivities and sensibilities are to the Muslim community and away from the pro-Israel okay. community. Very interesting observation. But we now know that if we were in a social setting with you, yes. in someone's living room, you would never say that you feel... That he's a Malik? No. no. Barack Obama is anti-Israel. No. Okay. You. I have no idea. I, uh, you I understand people are saying this? Oh, yes, for sure. Um, they are wrong. Um, he is not anti-Israel. Uh, what I think is that he is in a... Uh, he is, uh, again, he is wrong, too. Uh, but because he's wrong doesn't make him a hater of Israel. It certainly doesn't make Correct. him a Malik. What he is is he really believes, and he's a victim of this in a lot of different ways in his own personal philosophy, he believes that people should be equal. And when people are equal, he wants to even out the playing field. And by evening out the playing field, what you do is you raise the person up. And the person who gets ultimately hurt is the person with the special relationship. The person with the special relationship up until now was Israel with the United States. And by evening out the playing field, the person who got most hurt by this is obviously the Jewish people. Now, this is important and critical. That does not make him anti-Israel. I don't think he is, in, not in his own behavior, not in his own activities. He, they've made mistakes. Every presidency makes mistakes. But I think that he's wrong in his orientation. I think he actually believes that he can force, through sheer character, strength, personality, and charisma, two parties to sit down and come up with a resolution. And he's failing, obviously. That's it's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. That's where he's wrong. And so the paradigm is wrong. The way, by the way, Carter is also wrong. Certain things are wrong. And you have to go with what exists. And that's where Netanyahu's reality speech comes in. There was a subtext within his whole presentation in Congress in his response to Obama was the reality. You make peace 
with reality, have a sense of where the, uh, the realistic facts are on the ground. And that's where we are. He's not an anti-Semite by any stretch of imagination. However, it's easier to demonize him when you create that image. It's easier to say that as opposed to seriously consider his ideas, which is what we've done around the table here, which I appreciate very much. And it's very clear you, you enjoyed the speech, by the way. I, th um, I just thought the criticism of it was, was unfair. Top. Okay, yeah. And I and thought, as Steve said originally, the part that was the most problematic got no attention no at attention all. No attention Well, actually, it's a tiny part of the speech, the Israel-Palestinian section yes. in the first place. But what I'm trying to say in terms of the larger model is that the pre this president of the United States came to stay wrote in the election campaign and said, I would not tolerate my family and my children living under this situation. Now, I want that to be very clear. That was a statement which says, obviously, Israel has the right and responsibility to defend itself against this group out there called Hamas, which is lobbying rockets. He understands that conceptually. It doesn't necessarily fit into, that's the evening of the playing field, that doesn't necessarily fit into his larger gestalt. And that's where the problem sort of exists. Because in reality, see, he's, he is an intellectual. And at a certain point in time, the president has to move from intellectual issues to really getting his hands dirty. And that means re realistic understanding of what happens. They're not ideas anymore. They're practical issues. And that's where he really misses the so boat. Right. I, I, I hope I'll you're right. I'll come to you in a minute. Come to you in a minute. Um, it's not fair. Not fair. Yeah. OK. Look, we've spoken here around the table before. There is a certain uh, uh, an unfortunate penchant within the Jewish community only to fixate upon the negative. Yes. Uh, someone that you disagree with does not mean the person is an anti-Semite or anti-Israel. I'm appalled at the tendency. I'm appalled at the growth of the tendency. Frankly, I'm appalled by some of the ads that run in your newspaper that portray him as a thug. I, uh, if I were ads in the newspaper, frankly, I would not run them. Uh, in terms of where he is, speak. well, in terms of where he is, I think what, uh, you know, what's just been said by, by, uh, by Micha is quite true, that he has a long record which demonstrates considerable empathy with Israel. A president who did not have that kind of empathy would not have made all the statements that you quoted from so eloquently that were statements that I really did applaud. We do obviously have some disagreements. There is, I think, a, a sense that the, uh, the close friendship between America and Israel under Obama's tenure, um, we've always prided ourselves upon a special relationship, a special friendship. The friendship, I think, remains intact. I think the challenge over the next couple of years, and you know, were, there a, were there to be a second term, is will, will that special relationship continue? And there I frankly am a, at, least a, at least ambivalent of saying that he is, he is someone who does support Israel, someone who really admires Israel. But he also campaigned on the notion that support of Israel does not mean support of Likud politics. Well, in and of itself, again, that's an unobjectionable statement, except recognize we do have a Likud prime minister right now, so that the areas for tension between America and Israel are considerable. I think the challenge to American Jewry is to try to keep America and Israel on the same page with as little daylight as possible. And that's, in that respect, it's not helpful to be um, engaging in the kind of uh, anti-Obama rhetoric that tries to portray him. The term Amalek, frankly, is one of the most appalling ones you can possibly use, because it means the incarnate of evil. You know, who are you actually going to use that about? A president of the United States who has been a good friend? But again, the term has been used, and I think it's, it's not only regrettable, not it's appalling. Mind. Steve? I don't oh, okay. You know what's interesting? I'm sorry. You know, Go ahead. The, what's, what's interesting is that, I, I mean, and you're quite correct, the problem, I think, unfortunately, has become a personality. For some reason, the chemistry is not working, hasn't worked between Bibi and the president. And they've had enough meetings now to sort of repair that chemistry, and it does, I mean, I think, and, and f to give this most specific example, when the photo op took place in the White House last Friday, there was a certain, if they really had good chemistry, regardless of the, the, the dissatisfaction and, and hostility that Bibi felt to the Thursday address, I don't think he would have allowed it to spill over to, oh, the, no. to those comments. Yes. These are games that are being played. Unless that's the camera. No, no, but, no, but, no, but, but it was games. not, yeah, but they're, they're, they're playing to their audiences the politically in Israel, to the American What are you scene. referring to specifically? There, was a, there, there were comments made to the press where he, he appeared to, Bibi appeared to be lecturing the president about his dissatisfaction with the terminology used on, on the, 67. But and, well in, in Israel. In the okay. previous, in the previous uh, meeting at the White House, Obama excused himself to have dinner with his family right. and left the uh, Israeli prime minister with his delegation 
you're standing right. Standing still. You're absolutely now uh, to have dinner with his family, which honestly and truly, when one runs for president, one sort of puts their family on hold for a little bit. But at least for dinner with a visiting head of state, you could do that. They sat for 45 minutes wondering what was going to happen. Eventually, left for fear that they were being taped. Of course, they're being taped, right? And there were no phones that they could use that wouldn't be taped. Now that is a is a, a snub of the highest order. Coming off of that, he goes into the White House again for another meeting. Now, I, it should be very clear, these games are being played, but most of them are behind closed doors. None of this stuff should actually get out. When they do get out, they're deliberate. They're deliberate in order to jab publicly. Do they really, are they ever going to be friends? It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Why doesn't it matter? They've got to hold their personality at bay. Look, Clinton held Bibi accountable and responsible for the uh, assassination of Rabin. And it was a clear understanding of that. Yet they still held who responsible? Yeah, did you clarify Clinton. that? Yeah. yeah, I mean, Clinton? Yeah. Clinton had a lot of tension with Netanyahu. Yeah. A lot of tension. It was clear. And part of that tension was that he felt that Netanyahu uh, was responsible, set the tone oh, for the Rabin okay. assassination. Set the tone for the Rabin assassination. Okay. I don't want to go, go off and in that wonder, direction. And those tensions exist. You go through this. Under the Bush administration, Shamir was almost the persona non grata. They despise one. You continue the relationships. That's what you have. The reality is, it's not a question just between Israel and the United States. Right now, it's a question of funds for re-election. And that's what really is at stake here. Oh, will? Jewish Democrats abandon Obama? Well, that's the question. 2.2% of the United States is Jewish. 2.5% of the voting population. Yet anywhere between 30 and 60% of the war chest is contributed by Jews, the war chest of the Democratic Party. And in soft money, it's almost impossible to determine how much that is. But let's just say it's over 30%. A drop of 10% of that money in the war chest means that Democrats are going to have a lot of difficulty across the board in elections, not just in Florida and in Ohio, but I'm talking on a national level. What you that, means, that means that at any given time, as Jews might be leached away, not necessarily to the Republican Party, but leached out, if Ed Koch is challenging his, his uh, stance in the Democratic Party, Ed Koch is the incarnate of what would be a liberal Democratic Jewish uh, uh, player. If he's questioning it, a lot of other major players are questioning it what also. What do you predict? I predict that, the, uh, that somewhere close to 10% of those funds are going to be lost. If 75% of the Jewish community voted for Obama it's last not time? The vote. They're not going to. No vote. No president is, uh, sinks or swim because of the Jewish vote. They sink or swim because of Jewish contributions. So you're afraid to the, the Jewish money won't go to I'm not afraid. I'm describing. Afraid. <laughs> I'm describing. <laughs> I'm describing. <laughs> what the people? I, don't, I don't have a horse in the race. I'm trying to explain to you where the real power is. And that's why the decision to use this line was a serious political error from someone who thinks about elections all the time because he's going to lose money. When you lose money, you potentially lose an election because no one questions the fact that the more money you have behind you, the more capability you have for winning an election. Will the Jewish community turn on Obama? Look, uh, uh, under any circumstances, there's a, a minimum uh, pro-Obama vote or pro-democratic vote sure. of 60%. There's a maximum vote of 80%. The question is that 20% in between. He got close to 18%, 90% of the 20% that's a swing vote. Uh, at present, uh, it has to be put in the, in the context of uh, the uh, fluidity of the relationship. Uh, in other words, that it's much too early in the ballgame to be making those kind of predictions. Uh, if I was sitting in the White House, I would probably offer exactly the same kind of uh, counsel as saying, you're going to get 60% no matter what. Whether you're going to get 80% is dependent. As far as the contributions are concerned, uh, you're really then talking about a limited number of people, uh, each one of whom can be approached on an individual basis, and you find out what their reaction is. There's, uh, you know, there, are, there are major donors on both sides of, of the coin, and that, frankly, has always been the wisdom of Jewish political activity, <laughs> that we, have, we are found on both sides. What do you think? Your political let, let, side let, 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 <laughs> let me just, uh, first of all, I think that we are talking about a, a swing in the middle. We are talking about, however, in American politics, in terms of voting, we're talking about key states. We're talking about whether or not there's enough potential negativity that, to emerge in terms of the Israel issue. How many people among the Jewish community actually vote only on the Israel issue, which is a question. Has to do, and dwindling. To, to what extent are uh, those states therefore close enough that they potentially could vote, could swing the vote against? I think if I were making a prediction today, I don't think there's a doubt in my mind that Obama will be reelected. It could change tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. could you, but, and, you know, 
But what's very important is probably it will affect House and Senate races. Um, what, what you're going to see is more money going from the Jewish community to Republicans in the House and Senate races. And what it means probably is that there's a very significant possibility that the Democrats could lose the Senate. Now, they, they have 23 seats that they're holding right now, which are up. That's, a, that's just by virtue of what happened six Rotation. years ago. Rotation. Right. And it has to do with the seats that are up. It has to do with open seats and so on. It could affect that, and it will affect as well the, the, uh, the House races and whether the Democrats have any possibility to regain control of the House. Now, what, what I saw among elites and activists in Washington this past week specifically said to me they're dissatisfied with Obama, meaning they're dissatisfied with the Democrats, meaning if they and they are the people who have, who are going to work, who are going to be involved, who are going to campaign, and who are going to contribute. Mm -hmm. And these are the people who are saying, we're going with Republicans. We're going to go and rep Now, this can change. We're talking 18 months out. I'm not saying it couldn't, it won't change, but there's a lot of work that the Democrats have to do. It also depends on who the alternative is. Mm -hmm. If the alternative is someone who, and we don't know who the alternative is at this point, um, if it's somebody who captures the imagination of the Jewish community in a big way, it, it, what can happen. But in general, what do you hear when you hear people talk about this? Do you hear people saying, we're going to turn from Obama uh, in the election upcoming? Okay. The people that I deal with mostly are in the observing Jewish community. Um, maybe, I don't know what it's like on, in the, on, the, on the Upper West Side in New York, outside of that area, Obama was never popular. Um, in the Orthodox community? In the Orthodox community. I mean, there are people who like him. Sure. I'm not, it's certainly nothing I'm not talking about across the board. Um, this week did nothing for him <laughs> in that regard. Um, and do I think he's going to get any more of the Orthodox vote than he got last time? I'm sure not. I mean, I, the, the Russian Jewish community in New Jersey, which we hear from a lot, we're never thrilled with him either. I don't, I'm not telling you something you don't know. Right. And um, I don't think he helped himself with them either. Okay. So tell, we're almost out of time. Talk to me for a moment about how you reacted and what you think the significance was of Netanyahu at a joint session of Congress. Well, first, it's, it is truly inspirational, <laughs> the way in which he's received. He's a remarkably gifted orator. And um, it is very interesting to see how it's being played, both out of the White House, who were petrified that it was a loose cannon. They had no ability to control what was to be said, especially given the jabs that were going back and forth over the few days before. And they were pleased. Contentment was the exact expression they used out of the White House, contentment. The reality, though, is that it shows something which is important for all of us and all of your viewers to recognize, and that is that Congress really represents America. They represent America far better than Pennsylvania Avenue because it's a much broader base, and they're much closer to the people at hand. So when he's expressing that to Congress, and when he's getting that kind of reaction from Congress, what it says is all those questions that we've been debating back and forth today, the real friendship and real power uh, that Israel and the United States have, that real special relationship is right there on Capitol Hill. And it was, it, it's downright inspirational. And to read it, it's sort of interesting. It's a speech of 40 minutes, 50 minutes, 50 minutes. And when you read it, it only takes like, like 14 minutes to read. But because it was interrupted so many times, it's truly phenomenal. Not because it was unique or that he said anything spectacular and he punched his lines. He rewrote that speech three or four times. They had to reconceive it based on what was going on. But he chose the middle of the road there. He chose not to make it a, an activist speech. He chose to make it a unity speech between the uh, Jewish state of Israel and the people of the United States. The, the reception to it, um, obviously, it is partly a, tr a tribute to his talents, which uh, everyone, everyone, I think, respects that. But uh, beyond that, it should remind everyone else, 97% of the pro-Israel support in this country does not come from the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. The cause of it's Israel American, right? is incredibly resonant with American public American. opinion. Again, all the hysteria in the Jewish community notwithstanding, we should not lose sight of that. Secondly, I, I do think there's an element here of symbolism. Uh, what other nation state would have its, uh, its leader be invited to address a joint session of Congress? That says, remark talk about the legitimacy of Israel. That's about as legitimate as one can get. More than just legitimate, it means respect, affection, even love. I can't put a period here. I can only put a semicolon. <laughs> I love sitting with the four of you. 
and I can't thank you enough for the different insights that each of you bring. You know how much I enjoy each of you personally, but to be able to share you with a national audience is thrilling for me. So we will just, I'll continue to ch chase you and see if I can get you to come and sit at this table. But Gil, and Micah, Susie, Stephen, I, I can't tell you what it means to me. Thank all of you very, very, very much. Pleasure, pleasure thank to join with you. Thank you. Thank you. So there you have it. I hope our discussion has given you food for your own thought. As always, we love to hear what you have to say. Please write me or email me or post on our Facebook Shalom TV wall or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who can send a tax-deductible contribution of $36 or more to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media to help support our programming. Tax-deductible checks may be made out to GEM and mailed to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. Please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. And we thank you for your kind support.